Hello everyone. Welcome back to another episode of r slash malicious compliance. In today's episode, will you train your own replacement and make yourself obsolete? Of course I will. If you absolutely insist that I have to move the pallet immediately, then move it I will. Private property, not to this Karen. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe so that you will never miss a video. Let's get started. Will you train your own replacement and make yourself obsolete? Of course I will. On mobile, English is not my first language, throwaway, blah blah the usual. Let me first say I have been a lurker here for quite some time and always enjoy your stories. Especially when you stick it to stupid bosses. This happened some time ago, but as I think it would fit here. Actors. Names changed up. Bob, boss at the time, old, can't keep up with technology, but had been with the company for a long time and so got to be my boss. Hans, hero of this story, friend from school who works in the same company, but in management but in a different department, helped me get this job for years prior. Caroline, co-worker who is not the smartest tool in the shed but makes up for it in work ethic. Carl, normal co-worker who has worked at company for six years and handles mostly the old client's accounts. Has a family, very busy. Me, well, me. Guy in his late twenties, a little geeky, likes computers. This was a small company and our team of three were best described as tech support for our clients, but it went a bit further than that. I usually helped with setting up databases and also advised clients from time to time if they would benefit from upgrading their plan etc. As normal with tech support, we got tickets from the clients and would work away at them one by one. I liked the challenging problems and usually tried to work hard at them, and it just so happened that Caroline liked the more standard problems and enjoyed doing something she already knew over something new every day. Nothing wrong with that. As you might imagine, we'd have made a good team and had this kind of unwritten rules who took which tickets. Win 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 win. Me, Caroline, company and client. Until we got a new boss, Bob. He immediately noticed that I was working far fewer tickets than Caroline. I tried to explain to him how not every ticket is the same workload. But because he wasn't very tech savvy and didn't understand half the stuff I was doing, he did not understand. Also, around one month later, we got a huge new client and I spent a week on site and setting up all the databases and stuff they needed. This drew down my month average ticket numbers even further. Duh. If Bob would have only had half a brain cell he could have figured out why. Now came something I did not expect from Bob. He said we need more help on the team and he was approved to hire a fourth member for our team. I was excited. We all were. We had this new huge client and things were not yet running smoothly, and anyway our company was expanding fast so this actually made sense. And he specifically asked me to basically do the recruiting process, and to work the new guy in. He might have figured out that he did not have a clue what we were doing I thought, which I was happy to do. That same night Hans calls me which is weird because Hans is not a caller, he is a texter. He basically said, you should come over to my house tomorrow, I have some beers that need drinking. So the next day I get to Hans' house and we are just talking about normal stuff. We see each other maybe once per month and have a big overlapping friend pool. But this time it was just me and him drinking beers, no other friends around. After some beers he mentioned that he had just updated his resume the day before and that everyone should always have an updated resume on hand. Do you have an up-to-date resume he asked. I felt this was a weird question and had an idea where this was going so I said no. But should I? Is there something you know about that you want to tell me? Well I am just saying that everyone should have a resume ready but I of course couldn't tell you if Bob thinks about letting you go, but I also couldn't tell you if Bob is not thinking about letting you go. I thanked him very much for the beers and left shortly after that. So I know I am getting fired and I have the suspicion that Bob has just asked me to hire my own replacement and train him to do my job so he can take it. This is finally where the sweet MC comes in. I fully comply with hiring a fourth member of the team and also pick one best suited for what Bob wants. High ticket numbers. So I am thinking not so smart person with a sloppy attitude that does not care if the customer is happy. After all customer satisfaction was not important to Bob when he talked about my ticket numbers. I get right on it. Many people apply, some good ones, but I weed those out very quickly. Resumes with lots of spelling mistakes and little experience in the sector are the ones I invite for an interview. The interview stage is trickier because now Bob and someone from HR is sitting in with me, but I am still asking most of the questions and giving my opinions on the candidates. But because I weeded out the good ones when Bob makes a decision he just chose the best of the worst, 
in my opinion not even the best because one applicant was actually quite good but I asked him stupid questions that did not even make sense and when he could not answer them I made him look really bad. Sorry John. I advise one candidate he ends up picking because he will work very fast and will get a lot of tickets done. At this point I have another job lined up in for months time, but I wanted to get fired by Bob to get some sweet severance pay. After two months of training Mr. New Guy, I have just shown him how to do basic tickets, which he can do quite well and fast but makes a lot of mistakes with, and have let the hard ones slowly build up. Carl notices and as he would be the only one after my firing to be able to handle them I let him in on what I was doing. As chance will have it he had just gotten an offer from another company and since he also did not like Bob he already decided that he will take the offer, but said he could sit on it a few weeks and time it with my firing for maximum destruction. Then I tell Bob I am done working in the new guy and a week later he tells me he sadly needs to let me go because my numbers had not gotten better. He actually used against me that I had not been doing that many tickets while I was training the new guy. How dumb can you even be, Bob? He also wished me a lot of luck finding a new place to word it with my work ethic. This had been the day I was waiting for and I just thanked Bob and reminded him of the four months worth of severance I was owed now and also two month worth of vacation, had not taken and carried over and was now entitled to get paid out. As I am heading out I tell Carl what had just happened and he opens his drawer with the sign to week's notice and walks into Bob's office. My girlfriend had vacation time left and we decided to leave for a four-week holiday to New Zealand the next week. I proposed to her there. As the saying goes, spend one slash for of your severance on the engagement ring. I started my new job one month after returning from NZ and even got a nice pay bump and a good boss. I made sure to thank Hans again and he kept me in the loop on how my old department went down the drain very quick and Bob was let go some time later. When that happened they actually approached me for taking his job and I declined. But that would have been the ultimate duck you to him. About five years later, last year, I started a company together with Hans doing much of the same thing but in a different city and so far it is going really well. If you absolutely insist that I have to move the pallet immediately, then move it I will. I'm a retail merchandiser. I assist with refits and new store setups, or sometimes just get sent to be an extra pair of hands where a store has too many people off sick or on holiday. And even during refits, we're sometimes expected to work the delivery for the aisles that we've been rearranging that night, as the store's own staff have, for obvious reasons, been unable to access them all night. On this particular shift we've been doing the beers, wines, and spirits section. Now this is the sort of shift where you're practically guaranteed to get some wastage. Bottles smash, can split, it's just accepted as the price of moving literally hundreds of them in the course of a single night. All you can is hope you're not the one who goes home smelling like a brewery. We'd finished up the actual move, and had started working the six pallets of delivery as well, but the store manager was fretting. He was starting to get very antsy about our chances of finishing up and clearing the floor before the store opened for the day, and his main concern was about how we were handling the overstocks. We had absolutely blitzed the first pallet, all hands working it and it alone, in order to empty it so we could stack the overstocks onto it. As soon as the last case of booze was removed from the blue boards, we moved the overstocks onto it, and then split up to work the other five pallets simultaneously. As we worked, we added more to the first pallet. When we're in luck, we can get the overstocks from six pallets of delivery onto a single pallet. By the time the manager came around, dragging a pump truck with him, the stack was about four boxes high, about hip height on me. It wasn't the prettiest pallet stack you've ever seen, but it was stable. While it wasn't moving, someone had gone to fetch a roll of pallet wrap so we could move it safely. But that's the sort of thing that store staff tend to hide and guard jealously so we knew he'd be gone a while. Manager, what's this pallet? Someone, delivery overs. Manager, it needs to be off the floor. Someone else, co-worker, has gone to get the shrink. Manager, I want it gone now. Team leader, it's not safe to move without wrap. Manager, you don't need that if it's stacked properly. Move it now. At that point he shoved the handle of the pump truck at the closest person which was me, and he stood back to make sure that we removed the pallet from the shop floor. Now I'm not the best pump truck operator in the world. I have a lack of proprioception that extends to anything that I'm pushing, pulling, carrying, or steering. Normally I wouldn't go anywhere near a pallet of glass bottles, but everyone else backed away. They knew what would happen if anyone jacked that pallet up and tried to move it, and they wanted no part of it. The manager obviously wanted it moving though, and it was his store. 
so I carefully got the forks under the pallet. No ramming it in for this baby. Gently lifted it off the floor and started moving as smoothly as I could. One step, two steps, three steps, enter the slalom of bakery tables and fridges between alcohol and warehouse. I surprised myself by getting past the individual rolls table without incident. But when I started to maneuver around the cream cakes fridge I heard the unmistakable sound of bottles smashing. I looked behind me to confirm it. A corner of the pallet had decided to acquaint itself with the linoleum-covered concrete floor. Wine, whiskey, vodka, and rum were all mixed in a spreading puddle on the floor. Oh, and on the manager who'd been following behind, presumably wanting his pump truck back once the pallet was stowed away, who hadn't bothered to try and stabilize the collapsing boxes. My team leader had also been following, at a more sensible distance. Team leader, looks like it needed wrapping. Private property, not to this Karen. Well, it finally happened. I ran into my first Karen. I'm a volunteer search and rescue canine handler, and my dogs are pit bulls. I've been in search and rescue for 11 years now and never really had much of an issue. Every once in a while we come across someone who doesn't understand what we do, but after a few minutes of explaining it, people change their attitudes and even get excited because we allow them to follow us and see what we are doing. Yesterday I was working my younger dog, who is almost ready to certify but still has some minor issues we are training him on. We are working 20 acres of private property out of the 600 acres available to use. So my dog is off leash, has three collars on him and is searching wonderfully. I'm watching my dog, and I can tell he has human scent. There is obvious body behavior you can see when a dog is in scent versus not. He's working around a large wood pile about 100 yards from me when he takes off over a ridge line. A few minutes later he comes back and jumps on me, which is how he tells me he has found someone. I start to follow him when I hear a lady yelling. By this time my dog has come back again and told me again he found someone. Still running behind my dog I come around a corner and there is Karen in all her glory, swinging a hiking pole at my dog. I give my dog tons of praise. I mean here is a lady screaming at him and waving a scary pole in his face, and he didn't care at all. He did his job very well. That's what I want to see in my dogs. Karen, how dare you let your dog off leash? Me, sorry ma'am. I'm with search and rescue and we have permission to train our dogs off leash. Karen, no. No dogs are allowed off leash. Your dog is dangerous. Me, ma'am, you are on private property. My dog is training to find missing people. Karen then whips out her phone and starts recording me. Karen, you think this behavior is acceptable? Me, yes. That is his job. Karen, I demand to speak to your supervisor. Well, how my team works is, we have senior members. We technically have one person in charge of the team, but we are considered supervisors and in charge of everything. We have full rights to speak on behalf of the team, dismiss people for dangerous behavior, make decisions, etc. Me, I am the supervisor. Her, there is someone above you. Me, actually no there isn't. I'm sorry you are upset but what happened is what my dog is supposed to do. Her, you should ask people before you let your dog run up to them. Me, you are trespassing on private property. You shouldn't be here. Karen, what's your name? Me, I am so lost again. Karen, your last name. Me, you don't need that. Karen then turns to the two men that were with me and takes photos of them, and my dog, who is still off leash, playing with his pink pig and laying in the snow. Karen, do you approve of this? What are your names? Both guys shrugged and said she is the one in charge. Then finally Karen huffed off yelling, and my dog got back to work to find the guy that was hidden 20 feet away from where this whole thing took place. Later, she ran into the rest of the senior members and had words about how my dog charged her acted very aggressive, and how I gave him treats for that behavior. They also tried to explain it to her and she told them to hush, and there was obviously something wrong with everyone on our team. My dog was perfect dog tax. Oh and our dogs don't wear vests while working because where we are has tons of underbrush, and some of our dogs have gotten seriously hurt wearing vests. We only use them on roadways or during firearms deer season. If you made it to the end of the video, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share and we will see you in the next video.